Hello, everyone. Welcome in to today's Federal Employee Benefits webinar. My name is Nick Child. I'm the Director of Client Experience here at Harris Federal Employee Law Firm. Really excited to be here with you today. This webinar is a long time coming. Um, we are going to focus specifically on what federal disability retirement can mean for USPS employees. So if you're a postal worker, um, this is the webinar for you to learn about how your uh, injury or disability uh, that's limiting you in, in your work, uh, how federal disability retirement can help with that. So this is a great topic. I've got Grant Ostrander here with me. He is the director of operations here at Harris Federal. He uh, started Harris Federal with Bo and Brad uh, back about two decades ago. So they've been doing it for a long time and and Grant knows a ton and it can really explain this really well. So I'm excited to have him here. And we also have uh, Kimberly Bear, our director of case processing here at Harris Federal. She is a, a designated federal retirement consultant. Um, Grant is as well. And uh, they are experts in this field and um, are, are excited to, to talk with you about this benefit and, and what that means for you um, USPS employees. So before we get started, I just wanted to bring your attention to the comment section in the bottom right corner of your screen. There's a chat box there where you can ask questions. We have a team uh, of uh, employees here that are ready to answer those questions as they come in. We'll try to get to them as quickly as possible um, and answer those as best we can. If we're not able to get to your question, give our office a call, schedule a free consultation. Uh, we are here to help you and walk through all your options with you. So make sure you take advantage of that, though, um, while we're on here to ask some specific relevant questions to this webinar. We're excited to present this to you. Um, so with that, um, Grant, let's go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, we're excited to talk today uh, with our postal employees and uh, our potential postal employee clients and uh, kind of cover some of the information and how a federal disability retirement specifically uh, works when you are uh, a postal employee. So um, I've got, I'm, I'm really blessed to have Kimberly uh, here with me today. She's an expert in, uh, in case processing. She's the director of case processing here at Harris Federal, uh, and she's a federal retirement consultant. Uh, so uh, Kimberly, thanks for being on with me. Grant, I'm really happy to be here. This is some really good information for those postal workers to know since their process is a little bit different. So this is going to be some great, important information. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it too. I think one thing that's really interesting is they have uh, a few things that are more uniform and also more difficult than other agencies uh, in the federal government. And there's a lot of them. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks that work in the postal department, postal, postal service. Um, so uh, let's just go over a few things that we're going to cover today, and, and we're going to start with some of the, the typical benefits that come with a federal disability retirement, uh, some of the highlights uh, and, and additional uh, kind of add-on benefits besides the main annuity. Uh, and we're also going to talk about some of the specific postal uh, application process features. Uh, so uh, with, without uh, wasting any more time, let's, let's jump in here and start talking a little bit about what it means to understand <clears throat> the, the process of filing for a disability retirement and what the benefits actually are. So uh, Kimberly, let's, uh, let's talk about where a disability retirement comes from. So the disability retirement, so this is actually a benefit that's already sort of built into your retirement system, and it's a great benefit that only federal employees have. And ultimately, you have to go through the process with the OPM, Office of Personnel Management, to be approved for this benefit through the uh, federal retirement system. Yeah, and you know, they, there are very few people left anymore that are still on the civil service retirement system. Almost everyone has transitioned to the federal employee retirement system, but either way, it's got to go through the OPM. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so when we talk about the benefit itself, it, it's kind of high level is there's, there's a monthly annuity. Um, there's the availability to earn money in the private sector in addition to that monthly annuity. Um, you get to keep adding credible years of service to your service history 
and you get to keep your health and life insurance and, and, and move those things on into retirement. So it's a really good thing for people who are unsure about their, their ability uh, to uh, continue working for the federal government in their current position. Um, so from there, when we talk about that, that monthly annuity, we want to talk about the money. You know, we want, show me the money, right? We want to uh, we want to understand what that looks like for these people. They, people are interested in, in how much can they afford to do this or not. So, Kimberly, can you go through um, what what they're going to get? Absolutely, Grant. So, for the disability retirement annuity, this is going to be based off your high three salary, and you will receive 60% of that high three for your first year. And every year after, until the age of 62, you are going to receive 40% of that high three. And then, of course, just be aware that if you are going to keep your health and life benefits, that does have that premium into retirement, and this is taxable income as well. Yeah, and I think one thing, one question we get all the time is, uh, how, in what way is it taxable? And the, the number one answer we can give you is you need, you need to talk to, to a CPA and get some, some tax advice. But uh, it comes in as retirement income or ordinary income, not as earned income. So it does reduce your tax bill uh, because you're not going to pay FICA taxes, but it is definitely still taxable income. Um, and, and when we talk about it, I know one thing that a lot of people... Um, when they hear high three, they kind of get this idea, but it, it's a slightly trickier thing to, to, to explain than, uh, than to understand. It's easier once you kind of see it, uh, but it's hard to say the words that help people understand what a high three is. Um, but Kimberly, I know you're really good at it. Can you give us the kind of definition there of a high three? Yeah. So when people say the high three, what they are referring to is the average of your highest 36 consecutive months of basic pay. So, you know, for most employees, this is going to be the most recent 36 months, but it could be your first couple of years of service if that was when you earned the highest consecutive. And one thing that's really interesting about this too is people say, well, I've been off of work. And it actually calculates at your salary, um, even if you didn't earn money during that period. Um, so if you were on workers' compensation or on leave without pay, whatever your salary was at that time, that's still getting counted if it's a part of that highest 36 consecutive months. So that's a little kind of um, extra math uh, to throw into the equation. Um, but when we talk about, uh, you know, uh, what a high three is and then what a 60 percent is year one and then a 40 percent is year two we get this kind of nice looking graph here for everyone so you understand what portion of your take-home pay are you looking at taking home again if you switch to a disability retirement and for almost everyone um, this is going to be a significantly uh, uh, boosted annuity from the earned annuity that they would have available if they were old enough to retire. So um, we, we want to kind of highlight that the idea here is that this is designed to be a boost to an income to help you reach your full retirement age. It's not designed to be a total income replacement. That is correct. So it is, again, like we said, uh, a rare benefit for just the federal employees. And, uh, you know, regular people don't have this benefit. If they get injured, they don't get to get a higher annuity to carry them over or sort of bridge them over to the age 62 when their regular retirement will calculate. Right. That's what we, that's what we call it here in the office is a bridge to 62. And what we mean there is FERS was set up with all of its components to incentivize federal employees working until they turn 62 years old. That's when the premiums come in and the boosts and the bonuses and when you're first eligible to receive Social Security benefits, uh, you'll be past 59 and a half so you can draw out of your TSP. Um, and so everything in FERS was designed for federal employees to work to their 62nd birthday. And so this is usually only something we can help somebody with when they've got a medical condition that is preventing them from making it to 62. Uh, and so when they hit, turn 62, if they've been on disability retirement, 
that time recalculates and it adds those credible years in and they do get paid that 10% bonus if they've got the, the minimum year requirements there. That's exactly right. And so we do understand that that 60 and 40% is, you know, a, a significant reduction in your uh, high three or what you were receiving while you were working. So one of the great benefits that Grant mentioned earlier is being able to work in the private sector. Again, this is uh, one of the things that's specific to disability retirement. While you're receiving that annuity payment, you can receive up to 80% of what your position currently pays. So as long as you're within those medical restrictions, you can get a job elsewhere if you're able to, uh, such as, I don't know, teacher, realtor, some kind of desk job or something like that that you're able to do. That's a that's a question I've I've heard of you know I I've been here for 17 years and I've heard that question well what could I do and the answer is anything you want uh-huh. as long as it's within your medical restrictions is is really the answer Exactly um, there's a lot of options out there Yeah and I think that I think that it can be hard to imagine but we've got lots of stories of clients who call us and they they've moved into something else and they really love it um, and it can kind of free them up Uh, to at least some extent, because they're not under the financial requirements to earn that full salary amount. They need to make somewhere around half of what they used to make in their federal job in order to keep a same standard of living. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that you've had uh, many clients who've (laughs) uh, successfully found uh, employment in the private sector and really, really come out in a good spot. And if if we if we look at this next slide here, um, one thing that you can kind of see is that during that first year, there's actually potential to earn significantly more than you did on your federal salary alone. And even going on past that all the way up uh, to your 62nd birthday, that income uh, it can be that high, and, it, and it, we see it all the time. Um, it, it doesn't mean everyone's going to get there. Some people's uh, re, you know, restrictions are, are very severe, and some people are going to qualify for Social Security disability, which is, a, a, of course, a different benefit altogether, but that's a much higher medical burden and that, that they may meet because of their, uh, uh, because of their, their medical conditions. So uh, we want to we show this so that people understand the potential. I'm not saying this is guaranteed. We're just saying, hey, there's, there, is, there is life after federal employment. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of people are really upset knowing they can't do this federal job anymore. But moving on in the future, if you have that potential to find a new career, I, like Grant said, I personally have a lot of clients who have moved on with new careers and have found new meeting and really enjoy their lives after disability retirement. Yeah, and, and we've, we've spoken about it a few times here about this additional credible years of service. Um, and I think that's important um, to take a little time and kind of explain. Kimberly, can you, can you walk us through what that looks like and what we mean when we say that? Absolutely, Grant. So while you're receiving the disability retirement, those years are actually counting towards your credible years of service. So if you retire with or move on to the disability retirement with just a few years of service, you are still earning years of service that will be calculated into your regular retirement at the age of 62. And, and that's amazing, too, because like we just showed in the, in the previous slide, um, you could be drawing 60 or 40 percent of your health high three from the FERS component. Uh, you could be earning up to 80 percent of your high three in a private sector job, but still receiving credit as if you were working for the government and adding on to that, that long range, that long term 62 and older time period of your life. So that's that's a really good thing. And um, if you if you didn't have the minimum years for the 10% bonus that comes when you hit age 62, if you wait to retire until you're 62, um, th- these credible years keep adding towards that as well. So you could retire, say, 14 years of service and uh, and and be on the benefit for for seven years and hit that 21 years of total service, and it's still going to pay you the bonus on your 62nd birthday as if you just worked until that day. Exactly. And if you take a look at this next slide, you can kind of get a visual here of what we mean and how to calculate those extra years of service. So for example, on this page, 
you know, this example client here worked for 10 years and at the age 40 had to take disability retirement. So they continued to receive that disability retirement for 22 years until the age of 62. So when OPM recalculates things for them at 62, they are going to calculate their regular annuity with 32 years of service as if they worked that whole time. Yeah, that, that really is, um, it's kind of the unsung hero behind this benefit because it allows the retirement to continue to grow. Um, not only does it preserve what's already earned, but it, but it, it continues to get better um, for the long term kind of uh, annuity. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that I think that people look at oh, health insurance, and they look at the annuity and they say those are huge things and they are. But this this is uh, certainly underrated, Mm -hmm. but very, very important um, as a benefit of of, uh, a disability retirement. Oh, absolutely. And as you kind of mentioned that health uh, insurance and life insurance. So that does uh, carry on into disability retirement and over to regular retirement as well if you're eligible. So that's important to know. And just take note that the right now, currently, the Postal Service pays 50 per, 55 excuse me, percent of your premiums um, while you're employed with them. When you move over to the OPM, the OPM will cover 50% of those insurance premiums for you. Yeah, I think uh, I think the 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 health insurance, life insurance portion of this is something that's super important. It's a great benefit when you are a federal employee and being able to keep it in uh, even with an early retirement and have it continue on uh, is something that gives uh, annuitants a lot of flexibility and a lot of options when it comes to how their retirement, what their fixed costs are going to be. Um, so that's something I think is it's. You know, it's a huge deal to be able to continue uh, your group health and life insurance. Um, and at different points, you may actually have opportunity to, uh, you know, have a better option uh, in, in a life insurance policy or something. But, you know, boy, having something in a group health insurance plan like what, what federal and, and postal employees have, being able to carry that on is, uh, is pretty special. Yeah, just that assurance of knowing it's there if they're eligible and they can have it. That's really important. Okay, we've talked about the benefit. Uh, We've kind of run through at least the highlights. Uh, Let's take a little bit of time and talk about what it looks like to qualify for disability retirement. So um, this is unique and and only federal employees and postal employees um, have this definition of disability when it comes to a disability retirement. Kimberly, can you kind of walk us through, there's, there's so many different benefits that exist in the world that have the word disability or impairment or, uh, you know, workers comp, all these things that we, you know, we kind of equate and, and conflate uh, to being the same thing, but this has a unique definition. Would you kind of walk us through what that is? Yeah, Grant. So let's talk specifically about the way that OPM defines disability. So this is any medical condition that inhibits an employee from continuing to complete at least one of those major functions of their duties in their current position. That is a mouthful, and it's extremely specific. That's the way uh, lawyers write, I think, uh, is they try to they try to try to really define those words. But in in layman's terms, I always think it's easier to think about it. Are you less than fully successful in one of the major aspects of your job? And and those would include attendance, performance, and conduct. So if you if you're not hitting, you know all those areas, if there's even one area that you have a deficiency and you could have what is considered a disability by the OPM. Um, So let's talk about who is eligible. Um, The concept here using that definition gets us into this weird question of are, is someone, is someone totally disabled or are they occupationally disabled? Um, So I think that that's worth spending a minute on just to kind of further clarify what we mean. Yeah, I agree, Grant, because a lot of times people hear disability and think that means that they absolutely cannot work in any capacity. 
And for the OPM's definition, they just mean that you have an occupational disability, meaning you can't do this job, specifically at least one function of this job, of this federal job. So that is going to be different than that total disability. Right. And and we, we want to emphasize, we're talking about your job, not not some other job that someone else can do. We're talking about the one that you currently occupy. Um, so it, it, it's, it's not a complex idea, but it gets so tightly wound up with other federal benefits that use words like disability. Um, and as a matter of fact, there's, there's criteria that you have to uh, apply for other benefits in order to even be eligible for this one, and they use different terminology. So understanding the definition of this benefit really is something I think that can provide peace of mind and clarity to anyone that's considering it. Um, and when we talk about disability, we get to medical conditions. And so medical conditions, uh, there's a lot of things people think, well, it didn't happen at work, or they think, uh, it, you know, it, it was, uh, that's not, that's not a real medical condition. I don't know if that counts. And so we have, a, we, we, we have helped people with all kinds of medical conditions and diagnoses. So just, just walk us through kind of what that looks like in, in your mind, Kimberly. Yeah, Grant. So I talk to clients every single day here and I have had clients with medical conditions, physical conditions, really any condition on the books, you can qualify if it prevents you from doing that specific function at your job. So a lot of people are kind of concerned if this happened during employment or if it happened, you know, outside of work. And the thing that's special about disability retirement is that your condition or injury did not have to specifically happen while you were on the job. But this does have to have arisen during your federal employment uh, with your current position. And then also the other thing is that it could be just a pre-existing condition that has worsened while you were in this federal position. Right. This is a, I remember the first time I wrote these words a long time ago and thought, okay, I've got to figure out a way to explain this complex thing. Uh, and, And the idea is, Not that the medical condition started while you worked for the government or in that position, but that the inability to do the job arose while you're in the the, the federal position. So you can't come in with the disability, have no worsening of the disability, and then claim the disability. You have to have been successful for a period of time and capable of doing that work and then have the medical condition either originate or worsen while you're currently performing the position. So that's, it seems really complex again, but it's not a complex idea. It's just a complex wording. That's a really great explanation. That's a good way to hear it. All right. So um, a big thing people ask there too is, well, if I'm disabled, um, you know, I want to think about these benefits, but my, my employer, the postal service in this case has given me uh, a, a light duty assignment and I'm, I'm casing my route and, and then I'm staying back at, at the office and, and working on some other projects because my, my knee is the, is the main culprit of my disability and they're accommodating me with this light duty assignment, or maybe it's a work related injury and they're on limited duty and they think, Oh, that, then I can't claim disability because I'm on this modified duty assignment. Right, and that is not the case. So that light duty assignment, well, it's great because you're able to still work at, you know, at your current postal office, but that doesn't mean that you are working your job. You can't pers- perform your functions of your job. You're doing a light duty, which just is not your full-time duty. Right. So when we talk about uh, a modified duty, it it begs the question of accommodation. So let's spend a little bit of time learning about and understanding what the reasonable accommodation process looks like. So um, there's there's a whole special section of things that uh, that can be brought up 
uh, through the Postal Service. And, and uh, you know, I, I'd love for you to kind of take us through some of these things that a, that a USPS employee could expect to experience during the process. Yeah, absolutely. So once you submit that reasonable accommodation request, one of the first things that you can expect is to be contacted to do that DRAC meeting. If you guys don't know what that is, that's the District Reasonable Accommodation Committee. They will contact you to kind of discuss over the phone what you can and can't do and how to move forward with your reasonable accommodation. Um, This can be either over the phone or in person. One thing that I really do want to mention to you though is if you are in a leave without pay status and are intending to apply for that disability retirement, you would not want to attend this meeting because the postal service will pay you and that is going to affect your last day in pay, which will affect that back pay. Oh yeah, we don't want to mess with that. Yeah, that's <clears throat> that's certainly something we would want you to to contact us about. If you're if you're faced with that and you have questions, don't just go, just call us. We'll we'll walk you through it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So then so then moving on, we want to understand even more about what's kind of unique about being a postal employee. And how does the process go that might be different uh, than if you worked for, say, the IRS? So um, let's talk a little bit about the application submission and the HRSSC. Yeah, absolutely. So the Postal Service is very unique in their processing, and and we process them just a little bit different. So as Grant said, the HRSSC, that is going to be the Human Research excuse me, Human Resource Shared Service Center. This is the overall HR. Most of you are probably pretty familiar with this. This is who processes these applications. They are a third party. They handle all of the personal matters. And so this is where ultimately your initial application is submitted to. Yeah, and it's done by a third party in, in, out of Greensboro, North Carolina. <clears throat> and they, they have a unique process, and uh, they do some of the legwork with regards to filling out some of the supervisor's forms and the agency forms, but it's still good to be a good communicator. So when you're working with us, that's, that's something we try to be proactive with and try to help you know when to communicate with your supervisor. Even though they're going to request it from him, they, they maybe won't follow up as much as we all would hope. So anything that we can do to kind of help facilitate communication there is helpful. But once the application is received and all the things are verified and collected, they send the package to the finance center, the Postal Service Finance Center, which is in Egan, Minnesota, to collect the payroll records that will accompany any application for retirement, whether it's immediate or disability. So uh, as that thing uh, goes forward, it, uh, it, it travels from Greensboro, North Carolina to Egan, Minnesota. That is correct. And now, just so that you're aware, the uh, HRSSC also will send you a letter in the mail stating specifically that your application was forwarded on to Egan. So you will know where they are in the process there. I think uh, maybe the most confusing thing that the Postal Service does differently from other agencies is when they receive the first page of of an application for retirement, whichever type, they automatically send that employee a giant blue book that gives instructions about how to set up retirement counseling sessions where they plan to walk through the process with you. But they're not there to advise you. They're simply there to process your paperwork. And if you take a look at those blue books, they are all of the forms that you likely have already completed uh, either on your own or with your case manager here because we submit that whole application for you. And so it's, it's important to know that that information does not have to be repeated, but it's just a good thing to know, to keep in the back of your mind. I received this blue book. I know that they are starting to process my application. That's right. I can't tell you how many times we've submitted a completed application with all of the necessary forms and documents. And then three weeks later, our client calls us in a panic saying, they just sent me all these forms. I thought we already did them. And the answer is we did. This is automated. It's not something that is, uh, is thought through by anybody and they didn't make a decision. You didn't do anything wrong. They just automatically send it whenever they receive a piece of paper from, a, from an employee about a, about a retirement. So nothing to fear. Uh, if you're working with us, and we'd love to, to walk through that with you, so you still can feel free to call us and tell us you got your blue book. 
Um, also, they're in the process of working through some changes and how that counseling session uh, is set up. Uh, we're, we're working with them to try to kind of uh, give whatever input we can and see how to best work with them as they, as they look to change some of their processing there in Greensboro. Um, so we'll, we'll keep you up to date as things go forward with any changes or updates to their process. But that's the way it's currently being worked. And to keep in mind with their restructuring, their processing of their applications right now can take anywhere from one to six months and still be pretty normal. Right. And, uh, and again, once they, once they process that, they, it goes on to Egan. Egan pulls the pay records, and then they forward it to the OPM for that actual review. So nobody in the Postal Service is going to review the application for merit. They may review it for completion or all the documentation, but they will never review it for merit at the Postal Service. It's not their, uh, it's not their, their job to do, and they, if they were to review it, uh, it, it wouldn't actually have any bearing on a case anyway. Yeah, that is exactly right. Yeah, so uh, as we go through this process with folks, I think one thing to remember that is that it is a process. Um, we've, we've done this, you know, I, like I said earlier, I've been doing this for, uh, for 17 years, um, and, and I've been a part of over 6,000 cases. And, and personally, every process we work through, and, and, and each one presents unique challenges, but at the end of the day, we always uh, get to the end uh, by by finding the areas where we can communicate and uh, and walk people through uh, how to how to kind of finish out this process, whether it's with the uh, the shared service center, with Egan, uh, the finance center, or with the OPM office in either Boyers, Pennsylvania, or in Washington D.C. Uh, that's one thing that we try to bring to the table in these situations is uh, the ability and and the knowledge to uh, navigate if something doesn't go perfectly right the first time. Yeah, that's so right, Grant. And that's one thing that's great about us in our office is, you know, we know how most of these places process, when they process, what they're doing things, and on what time frame. So that's a huge benefit in working with us and just having that comfort of knowing what's going on in your claim. Well, uh, let's let's do a little bit of review. I think uh, I think I learned once upon a time if you ever give a slideshow, you got to have some key points at the end of it. So uh, let's talk about a few of these things just kind of to make sure that we we uh, we settle in on on a few of these. So uh, number one point here is the medical conditions don't have to be related to your employment. You don't have to have an injury on the job. That's exactly right. And another thing that we touched base on that is also wonderful to know into retirement is that it's a great way to secure that monthly income for you. That's right. You, in, in a season of uncertainty, it is something that can be very stable. Uh, you can also earn money in the private sector while continuing to earn credible years of service. Um, and you get to keep your health and life insurance benefits if you so choose, uh, as long as you're eligible. And one last note there is just the processing time frame over at the U.S. Postal Service is unfortunately that one to six months. But if you ever have questions or concerns, you are always welcome to reach out to us. Yeah. So uh, one to six months at the Postal Service and then we turn it over to the OPM and and uh, and, and they have their own their own time frames as well. But uh, the processes in general are something that we'd love to talk with you about. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to call us and schedule a free consultation. That's going to wrap up our presentation today. Kimberly, thanks for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I'm going to kick it back over to Nick. Grant, Kimberly, great job. Um, this is a really a great webinar. Um, we have so many USPS employees that we talk with and work with on a consistent basis. And, and to finally get this information out there, for them and to show them um, what their benefits look like um, and specifically what this benefit looks like and how it can help them. I think it's going to be really great. Um, thank you guys for joining us today. Like we mentioned, we're going to leave the, the chat open here so that you can ask questions. Um, we'll be getting to those as quickly as possible, but we're going to leave it open for five to 10 more minutes. Uh, if you, if we can't get to your question, um, or if you have a question that's really specific to your uh, case, uh, please give our offices a call, schedule a free consultation. Um, that might sound like a sales pitch, but it's really not. We, we just want to uh, help you walk through the specifics of your case 
and, and kind of guide you down the road so that you know what the right options for you, that you know how to maximize your benefits and uh, set yourself up securely for the future. Um, but we really appreciate you being here. We know that if you're in a situation where you need this benefit, uh, that you never expected to be there. You're not looking forward to this necessarily, but it might bring you a lot of hope. It might allow you to take the next step into the future. So um, we really appreciate you. Um, we thank you for serving us, and it's our honor to serve you. Um, and we look forward to speaking with you and educating uh, people like you and, and federal employees out there. So we, uh, we look forward to it. We uh, put more of these webinars on every month, um, and we have a YouTube channel that is full of more educational resources like this. So um, please take advantage of those. So with that, we're going to wrap this up here, leave the chat open for a few more minutes, and we will see you next time. Thanks.